Thank you. <clears throat> this happened a, a little while back, but there was a guy on the West Coast. His name was Rainbow Herkenheimer, and that's his real name. He was a left-wing political activist, and he was going around handing out leaflets, uh, uh, trying to get everybody to be more tolerant to terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we need to be more sensitive to the world's terror. He called them terror facilitation specialists. You know? <laughs> Horkenheimer's, he's 56, that, that was a while back, but ref, refraining from using the ep, epithet, ep, something, terrorist, <laughs> because it would wound the feelings of people like Osama bin Laden, wounding their inner child. Horken, Horkenheimer, a long time peacenik, feel strongly that those people in the world's great center died because it was like their karmic duty, des destiny dude. And if it weren't so mean to the world's, if we weren't so mean to the world's terror facilitation specialists, things like this wouldn't happen. So it's really America's fault, he said. He said, we need to be naked and like go back to nature, dude, says McGill, as his wife, then there won't be any, any more terror and stuff. <laughs> oh Tolerance. Let me read you another. Uh, uh, this is exciting too. This is out of Beverly Hills. The National Chapter of Girl Scouts has just announced that the state of California has just issued a new merit badge that is unique to the to the California left, West Coast left coast. Uh, her, this lady's name is Miffin Buckley. Boy, they got funny names. <laughs> She's the spokesman for the California Chapter of Girl Scouts. She said that the new merit badge will be known as the Shopping Mall Spending Merit Badge. She said that the Merit Badge was developed at the insistence of some mothers of California Girl Scouts who realized that the new badge would be indigenous to the Golden, to the golden State. You're right. The National Chapter of Girl Scouts issued a statement saying that California will be the only state in which the new Merit Badge will be available. I'm glad of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to just start out tonight with that because, you know, Tolerance is what everybody's preaching anymore. We got to be tolerant. We got to be tolerant. The title of my message tonight is When is too when when are we too tolerant? Uh, can you be too tolerant? I guess is what I want to talk about. Now as we look at the seven letters of the book of Revelation, it's it's going to be helpful to remember a couple of things. Number one, they are a picture of seven kinds of churches that you can find in any age. Now these are, these are not just in one specific age category. They're all, they all exist at the same time. Uh, how, and every church in the world today will fall into one of these categories. You can describe them this way. Now the second thing I want you to remember is that these letters are prophetic. They're a preview of the entire age of the church falling into seven periods. The first coming uh, uh, first coming of our Lord to His second coming. And you can show this up in seven different periods. Even though you can see them all at the same time, there's still a description of seven ages of churches. Today we're going to be dealing with Thyatira. Thyatira is the name of the city and it was an important manufacturing city uh, uh, in this area. They manufactured dye. They, this, is, this is the area where the purple dye came from. That Lydia, remember Lydia soul? Some of you have been reading your Bible and Lydia was a, uh, she got that dye from this area. There was a certain weed that grew here that produced this, this color of dye. Uh, it was a garment making pottery and brass working area and uh, uh, most of the trades, this is, Thyatira was a big area for the trades. A lot of different trades had their headquarters there. People, if you want to put your son in a trade, you'd send him to Thyatira and, and you could join a trade there. Um, these trade guilds were, uh, were based on paganism. And if you're going to come in to be one of the, pay, one of the, the guilds, uh, you had to, most of the rituals for these guilds were, uh, were done in pagan, with pagan rituals. And uh, they were, some of them were horrible, some of the things that had to do, that the, the young people had to do to become a part of those trades, those guilds. <clears throat> and the Christians in Thyatira tolerated it. They just kind of said, well, that's just the way it is. 
and we'll just go along with it. We'll go along so we can get along. We're going to tolerate this in our area. Now, the contemporary world today values tolerance almost above everything else. If you just pull somebody off the street uh, and talk to them about philosophy and ideology of life, and the, boy, tolerance is a big thing today. Um, tolerance is a, is a critical part of loving each other. Now, you know, we do have to be tolerant. But not of, of sin, but of sinners. We're not to love sin, but we're to love sinners. But, but we can't tolerate sin. We have to stand against it. And that's what this church just did not do. It would not stand up against it. It just let it happen, kind of turned its, turned its back on it, said, oh well, boys will be boys. Let's just, you know, get on with it. Now, real love, please listen now, real love can never coexist with actions that destroy life. Real, real love cannot put up with it. If, if the things you're, you see or you observe and it's destroying lives on, on any kind of level, real love will not tolerate it. Okay? Now, we, we can call it a soft love or a tolerance, but not real authentic love. It has, it has to do something. It just, we just can't coexist with it. Now, how are believers, how are you and I, supposed to respond to these life-destroying ideas that float around our contemporary world. How do we respond? Do we just sit back and not make waves? Do we step back and, and uh, just kind of comment among ourselves or have prayer meetings for them? Or What do we do? How do we respond to th some of these things that are literally destroying families and lives and nations? What do we do? Well, that's what the Lord wrote a letter to these church at Thyatira about. And tonight, as we dig down through this, we're going to see what we're supposed to do. How we react to these sorts of things. So let's get in here and find out what God says to a tolerant group of people. First He said, that, and I'm going to outline it by saying this, we're support, God says, point out that God is and how we really live matters. He was trying to say, to these Thyatiran Christians. God is. He exists. You may, be, you may have turned your back on sin and think God has, but God has not turned His back on sin. He is. He, he exists. And how we live really matters. Now a lot of people in our world today say there's no absolutes. There are no absolute truths. So you live to your truth and I'll live by my truth. And, but listen to me. You cannot live by just an arbitrary set of truths because you're going to make up your own. And, and you, I promise you, when a culture begins to live by its own built, thought up and built up truths, that culture will degenerate and de de destroy itself. So let's read. 18. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, if you'll notice here, to the, one of the other churches, when, when, the Holy, when God spoke to them, He said, these are the words of the Son of Man. But now, to the church in Thyatira, He, he uses His other title, the Son of God. Uh, it's interesting, if you'll notice, that the Gospels were written to prove to us that Jesus was a man. Everybody knew He was God. Yeah. But the Gospels were written to tell us He was a man also. But now whenever God wants to, to, to get their attention here in Thyatira, it's a tolerant folks. This is the Son of God speaking. Okay? So He uses His different title. They need to rem be reminded. His blazing eyes and His feet indicate passion. He's not just standing by intolerantly watching these people destroy their lives and watching others, the culture disintegrate around. He's not just standing around idly twiddling his thumbs. He is blazing with fire. His eyes are blazing. His feet are blazing. He is passionate. He is, he is on fire about what they're doing. And that's what I want you to get out of this tonight. And if we think 
that we can just be intolerant and, and go along to get along and just kind of turn our back and say, oh, you know, that's how the world is. We need to know that God is. He is the Son of God. This is the Son of God speaking, and He is passionate. Then the next thing I want you to notice, I outlined it by saying, we need to get involved and make things better. In other words, get off the couch of comfort and make things better. Let's keep reading verse 19. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Now this is, this is kind of good news for them. He says, you Thyatirans, you know, you weren't so hot at first, but you're doing better. But there's still, I want you to know, I know your deeds. I know your love. I know your faith. I know your servants. But you are, and I know you're getting better. So what he's trying to say, look, I'm finding a few good things about you, even though you're tolerant. These are good things. Now get to work. Come on, he says. Let's go. Get going. Get involved and make things better. Now, the next thing he says to them, and I've said earlier in my introduction, but I want to say it again, we're to love sinners but hate sin. Now let's read verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. Now, who is this lady? Well, we don't know. She was like Jezebel. Now, probably her name wasn't Jezebel. She was probably had some other name. And she was a prophetess in the community of Thyatira. And she had, uh, you know, got quite a following of people who she led and spoke to. And, and she was a, a pagan. This, she wasn't Christian at all. She was a pagan leader. And so uh, she was probably part of the guild, uh, part of the guilds. And so whenever the guilds would go to have their young people come in to, to, for their initiation, it was probably involved sex. It probably involved uh, prostitution temp and temple worship. It was a horrible, horrible thing for these young people to have to go through. And so the Holy Spirit says to them, nevertheless, I've got this against you. You've tolerated this Jezebel and you've just let her do whatever she wants to do. You've stood back and watched and said, oh, how horrible that is. But you know how it is. We just can't. We don't want to make waves. Does that sound like anybody we know today? Yeah. Could that be some modern Christians? We don't want to cause waves. Let's just stand back. You know. Well, anyway. Now, this lady was probably closely linked to what we've been talking about, the Nicolaitans, remember? The, the Docetism. She was probably really involved in that, where she didn't believe what you did in your body mattered to your spirit. There was a lot of that going on in those days. Uh, but... For some ideologies or some philosophies, listen to me, there is, there, there is no tolerance in the, in the heart of Christians. See, we, there's some things we cannot tolerate. Now, when I start naming sin, please understand I'm going to miss some. That's why I'm very careful about naming sin. Because what, I, what I'll do is, almost every time I start naming sin, I'll just name the ones, I'll just name mine. You know, and I, but I'll miss some of yours. So if I don't step on your toes here in a little bit, you go ahead and step on your own toes. Amen? Because I'm going to probably miss some of yours. But these are just some things that interest me or that, that get me fired up. Number one, we cannot tolerate abortion on demand as a form of birth control. We just can't do that. Right. And as a nation, we cannot. Amen. We simply cannot do that. We cannot tolerate family destructive morals. Anything that destroys families. We as a church simply cannot tolerate it. We have to stand against it. We can't turn our back on it. Well, you know, that's almost, we're going to have anything hard to watch. It's going to be hard to find anything on TV to watch now. Yeah. We can't go to a movie anymore. You know, because these are family destructive morals that are being preached and promoted and, uh, and they're destroying us. We cannot tolerate driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs or, or let, allowing drugs to destroy your life. We cannot tolerate that. Now, let me say I'm going to stop right there because, you know, I, I don't want to talk about any more about because I'm going to miss some sin. But trust me, there's a lot of things we simply have, have to stand against. We, you know, we say live and let live. You believe what you want to live and I believe what I want to live. But we have to remember that God is a flaming fire of passion. 
And He knows the things that happen in our lives that, dis that destroy us. And He, listen to me, He hates the things that diminish us. He hates sin. It, and, and so He's going to be against it all the way through. He wants us to stand with Him also. Now then, He says to stand against any kind of teaching that destroys lives. Let me keep reading now. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Okay, now you're beginning to get a picture of this lady. Uh, <clears throat> she was very much like the Old Testament Jezebel. If you remember, the prophet prophesied to Jezebel that, that, she, would, uh, be, that she would be killed and she would be thrown down off of the wall and the dogs would eat her body. And you know what? The Bible records that. That's exactly what happened. They ate every part of her but her hands. They were just too nasty to what she'd, been, what she'd had them hands into. They wouldn't indulge with you. But this woman was like this. She was trying to get the Christians to abandon their loyalty to Christ's teachings. Oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, you know. So what if they have sexual uh, prostitutes and sexual things involved at the temple over at the pagan? You know, it's just that's just what men do, you know. It's it's okay, it, you know. Just turn your back on that. And then she'd say, "Well, eating food sacrificed to idols." I have trouble finding a parallel here. We don't have a a parallel to to apply this in our modern world. But let me tell you what it was like in the ancient world. If uh, Christians would come into an area and they didn't want to have anything to do with idols. They wanted to abstain from idols. They wanted to stay away from them. And so when you worship an idol in the ancient world, you would bring some meat to sacrifice to the, to the pagan priest. And those pagan priests would cook the meat and could cut it up and, and they would serve a meal for all those who came to worship. And so when you ate the meal, you were partaking of the flesh that had also been sacrificed to an idol. So the Christians felt defiled. Now Paul, much later, said, you know what? Hey guys, it's not what goes into your mouth that makes you... That, that it's what comes out of your mouth that really matters. So, so Paul had to straighten that all out, you know. But listen, don't miss the point. They, they wanted to... This lady wanted to pull people back into that way of living that was tolerating all kinds of stuff. Now let me say it again. We have to realize as a Christian, as a modern Christian, contemporary Christian, there are things that I can do that are not harmful to me. But if I did some of those things, I might weaken, I hurt somebody that's weak. I might hurt somebody that was weak if I allowed myself to get involved in certain things. But it wouldn't, it really wouldn't hurt my Christianity because I understand the truth about meat sacrificed to idols. I understand that. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart. So I understand that. But there are a lot of things in this life I don't allow myself to get involved in. Even though as a Christian, as a real believer, I could do, but I don't. Because I might hurt somebody. Okay. Then, the next thing he said to, to tell those people, they're in Thyatira, uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 21, he said to tell them, those people who live down there, that uh, tell them the truth about their wrong choices. They need to know the truth. They're making choices every day, but they need to know that some of the choices they're making are destroying them. So let, let's read it now, verse 21. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Now this woman, who, was in, who lived in the town of Thyatira, was a, as I said, a, a pagan prostitute, pagan uh, priestess, and uh, apparently the Holy Spirit had been talking to her a lot. God had been telling her, you're doing it wrong. You need to repent. You need to get this right. You need to get it fixed. But over and again, she was making a choice. She knew what was wrong. She knew what was right. But she kept making wrong choices. Folks, do you realize that that we all get to choose every day how we're going to live. Every day we get to make a choice. You may want to, you know, you, you may think it, that you're, you're not making 
overt choices, but you are every day. You choose. And so we have to remember, God said, I've been talking to her. I've been trying to, I've given her time. She knows the truth, but she refuses to repent and change the, see the light change. Then he said, don't be hesitant to remind sinners about the cost of sin. Let's read verse 22. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. And I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Please listen to me very carefully. <clears throat> God loves you so much that He won't tolerate sin in your life. God's not a prude. God's not a prude. All right? He, he's, he, know what, he knows what this is all about. He understands all that. <clears throat> he's not embarrassed about it. He's not prudish, but he knows that when we give our when we allow ourselves to make poor moral choices, he knows what it's going to do to us. He knows what it's going to do to his children, to his church, to the families. And he understands that he hates the what when these things are destroyed. So he says, I'm gonna I'm gonna put her on a bed of suffering. I'm gonna punish her. And I think you need to realize that God does this. Do you know that God sometimes will engineer our failures just to get us, uh, get our attention? Have you ever tried to do something and man, you just set out to do this for the Lord and, and it just fell in all around you? I mean, you try, the harder you try, the worse it got. You wonder, what am I doing? What's going on, God? My motives were clean, pure. I'm trying to do this, you know, and the Lord just engineered our failure. Sometimes the wheels just fall off. The wheels just fall off our lives. What's God doing? He said, I'm trying to get your attention. Moral failure is painful. And we need to teach others to fail is the worst of all. We simply do not, we cannot step into this. Here's what I want you to know. Then he says, Then all the churches will know that I am He who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Then he said to him, here's what you need to do. Hold on to what you have. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Now here's what we have. We need to speak this to the remnant. This is a message that's given to those people who have not been intolerant of sin, who stood for truth, who have lived morally <coughs> To those people, God simply says, just hold on. I'm not going to give any more burden to you. Just hold on. You're doing good. You don't have anything else. Just hold on. And then He says, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Verse 27. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. Here's what I want you to know. If you've been living pure for the Lord, you've been born again, you've trusted the Lord as your Savior, you're trying to love the Lord with all your heart, and your neighbor is yourself, and you're trying to live a pure and clean life, guess what? When you get to heaven, God's going to give you a lot more responsibility. <laughs> you know what the reward is for doing good? More work. <laughs> How do you like that? More responsibility. The better you do here, the better the more you're going to be doing in heaven. Amen. The, that's the truth. And that's what you need to know. Make good choices here. Listen, folks. Get ready to, to get to know Jesus. Yeah. Get ready to know Him. Let's read the, here, the last one, verse 28. I will also give that one the morning star. Who is the morning star? Well, it's Jesus. It's a, it's a symbol of Him. The morning star is the first star that comes up after the dark, long, cold night. I've been sitting out on a deer stand or, or hunting elk in Colorado or somewhere, and I've been out early, you know, trying to get out there ahead of, of the, the critters. And, and I'll be so cold. I mean, everything I've got is cold and shaking and shivering. I'm thinking, what in the world am I doing out here? <clears throat> and, and then here will come that morning star up over the horizon and then the sun begins to break through. What he's trying to say here to the to those of you who are holding on, not intolerant, but you're holding on. He's trying to say to you, folks, the sun's coming up. The sun's going to come up. 
It's going to be better. You hold on. You may have been kicked in the teeth recently by life. You may have been hurt. You may have been really messed with. But hold on. The night's coming, gone, and the morning's coming. Yeah. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Yes. The psalmist said. He said, I'm going to give him that one, the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says yeah. to the church. I hope tonight some of you can have ears that hear. Yeah. Some of you tonight are hurting and, and you're tired. You're weary of doing good. You've been fighting the fight. And hanging in the battle. Listen to me. Hang on. Hold on just a little longer. Don't quit. Hold on just a little longer because the morning star is coming. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Lord, tonight...